Welcome to this revision session on MEPOs. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through economic growth, unemployment, inflation, and then the balance payments. Um, very um, general overview of them all. Basically for all uh, the MEPOs, I'm going to go through the causes, the consequences, and the cures. Um, and then you can obviously take this, watch it again a couple of times and uh, make the best use of it as possible. So anyway, first thing I suppose, see if you can remember what your MEPOs are. So obviously we've got FEEBLES as an acronym, full employment, equal distribution of income and wealth, environment concerns, balance of payments, equilibrium, low and stable inflation, And sustainable economic growth. So the ones I'm going to try and get through today in this session, unemployment, balance payments, inflation and sustainable economic growth. So um, let's go with um, economic growth. So if you want to pause this video in a second and see as you, if you can remember as much as possible. So the types of uh, or what causes economic growth, what are the consequences of economic growth. growth. What are the um, uh, po positives as well of economic growth? Um, and then you can listen to the answers. Okay, so economic growth, first off, obviously, is an increase in the productive capacity. Okay. Of an economy over a specific period of time. Um, obviously measured by GDP, gross domestic product. Uh, which is the total value of all goods and services produced within an economy over a specific period of time. There's three ways you can measure GDP. You can measure it by total income, total output, and total expenditure, consumption, I suppose we could say. They should all equal each other due to the circular flow of income, which is the relationship, obviously, as you can remember, between households and firms. So households give firms originally factors of production, in return for factors of production, you get paid income, and then you will obviously spend your income expenditure, and in return for that, you will get goods and services, which is what we call output. So that is um, GDP in a nutshell. Um, types of economic growth. We've got short-run economic growth. We've got long-run economic growth. Okay, short-run economic growth is determined by SRAS and AD and long run economic growth is determined by your LRAS. So I've got videos on um, uh, SRAS, AD and LRAS. You might want to watch them again if you can't remember some of the stuff to do with that. But basically the short run, the determinant of growth in the short run is SRAS and AD. So anything that causes short run growth would be things like your twice J things that cause aggregate demand to increase. That's obviously just consumption but government spending's in there as well, obviously if exports increase, etc. And your SRS is obviously your COPS. And then in the long run, it's about the quantity and quality of your factors of production. Um, so there's a couple of ways you can draw growth, short run growth, sorry. Um, it depends what you want to eat or what school of thought I suppose you're going through. Price level, GDP on your Keynesian axes. You can obviously draw your, your sorry, I should say classical axes. You can obviously do YFE and you can do short run growth like that. A little bit of inflation there. Okay, so, or you can obviously just do your simple SRAS AD. And you can do whatever. You can do SRS shifting outwards, that's short run growth. Or you could do AD shifting outwards, that's short run growth as well. Um, so short run actual GDP and then we've also got um, potential GDP so that's obviously your LRAS at YFE price level GDP so if it shifts outwards that would be an increase in long run economic growth okay um, so that's the productive potential of an economy. I always stick in an AD curve just to make it look a little bit more. Um, or you can show a bit more on it, like the price level changing, going down. 
um, borrowers always help. So that's obviously um, economic growth, um, the two types. You can also do both on another diagram, which is your, oh, sorry, which is your um, business cycle. So that would be the inflation of trend or potential GDP. And then obviously you've got actual GDP, which goes about that. GDP there, time there, and obviously I'm sure you know your four business cycle phases now and your positive and negative output gaps. Um, advantages of economic growth. Hopefully you'd recall them. Leaf is how I remember my advantages of economic growth. Living standards. Um, employment effects. Accelerator effect. And fiscal dividends. Right, so what we mean by each of these? And obviously, first one, different standards. As the economy grows, uh, output increases. The technical definition for uh, living standards is uh, access to goods and services. So if there's more output in the economy, GDP is rising. Population is going to be fairly constant. GDP per capita rises. Average incomes have increased. So economic growth should improve living standards. Employment effect in the sense that um, as the economy grows, there's obviously going to be more demand for goods and services. So labour has a derived demand. So as we as we produce more goods and ser demand more goods and services, we need more workers. So there should be employment effects, economic growth and unemployment kind of go hand in hand. Um, economic growth and lower unemployment, I should say. Accelerator effect. Remember what the accelerator effect is. It's when there's an increase in GDP that leads to a greater than proportionate increase in investment. Okay, so it's GDP leading to investment which is obviously business spending and if you think about it if the economy is growing businesses are going to be optimistic about the future they'll be higher on the spirits there'll be more sentiment and more confidence in the economy so they will invest more and if they invest more obviously the assumption is that they expand businesses they invest more cap equipment they'll need more workers to operate and obviously help them produce more goods and services and fiscal dividend as the economy grows the assumption is unemployment falls so there'll be less spending on things like universal credit and job seekers allowance and um, they, they'll raise more money from VAT from more spending corporation tax income tax so the governments should have more money in that regards then and then you've also got your disadvantages which is your price okay so price price level uh, inequality So price level, obviously, if it is demand side growth, okay, it's quite important that it's demand side growth, it will be inflationary because as you know, for example, we'll look at soon demand pool inflation is A D shifts out. As long as you're not on the horizontal part of your LRAS, it will be inflationary. So if you just do classical theory, A D moves out, that'll be inflationary. Um and if you just think about it, if the economy grows and people have more money. That they spend the more, which should put upward pressure on prices. Inequality as the economy grows, it tends to uh, be more favourable for business owners, for people on higher incomes, for people on fixed incomes or benefits. Um, their incomes will will probably be indexed linked, so they'll be linked to some like inflation um, or average earnings. But the fact of the matter is that that'll probably not be as high as the growth in earnings and incomes of these people that. You know get more from the growth within the economy uh, it's also the case that some people that own uh, assets such as shares and your property normally in in with there's with the economic growth the value of them increases which creates a bit of a wealth effect their incomes or their wealth will increase and people that don't have access or don't own assets will see um, no benefit and actually if they're renting for example they'll, they'll just continue to pay and while the landlord probably benefits more environment 
obviously your negative externalities, your pollution, your plastics, your um, your 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 food miles, your um, your congestion. So environment, obviously, as the economy grows more, using more fossil fuels, etc. And then sustainability, um, economic growth, um, can, if it's unsustainable. Um, so, for example, if it is uh, through heavy demand side, if it is moving, if it's bottlenecking up the LRS. So what I mean by that is if the economic growth is quite near full employment. Okay, you're getting closer and closer to this idea of full employment. Um, it'll be very, it'll be very, very um, inflationary. This is whenever speculative bubbles form. This is whenever maybe um, banks are lending out a lot of money, so there's financial strain in the economy. Um, all this can obviously cause massive growth in in assets and spending, which obviously, as we know, isn't sustainable and can lead to bubbles bursting, which is obviously disastrous in the economy. So that's economic growth. Um, unemployment, pause the video, see how much you can recall about economic growth, or sorry, unemployment. So unemployment uh, is when an individual is able, available and willing to work at the growing wage rate. However, despite an active search for work, can't get a job and are able to start within the next four months. Okay, so definition for unemployment. Please get it learnt. Uh, there's two ways you can measure those unemployed. Uh, that is actually either via the claimant count, which literally just counts the number of people that are uh, claiming benefits, universal credit, or uh, JSA. And the second one is the labour force survey which is a household survey of about 60,000 households and it gives a more in-depth um, understanding of uh, unemployment statistics from within that household. Obviously, the claimant count, uh, some people don't claim benefits, so therefore it doesn't give a true reflection of, um, of the, the figure. Some people can overclaim. Um, yeah, um, yeah, some people, for, for example, can't claim um, uh, Claim, claim account because of their, their, their partners or their household's income. Uh, Labour Force Survey gives a more in-depth, holistic view of um, unemployment, which is um, uses this internationally agreed definition um, to, to find those people that are unemployed. Um, types of unemployment. Uh, I always remember Ford specialised in selling cars, technically you should say I suppose red cars. So we've got frictional, which is also known as transitional, and that's the movement between jobs, so it's short term unemployment. It also includes that period of unemployment whenever graduates are looking for their first job. So it's frictional unemployment, seasonal. Hopefully I don't have to explain that in too much detail. At different times of the year there's very in demand for certain industries. For example, construction, retail, hospitality. So people will be left without jobs at certain times of the year because there's no demand for what it is that they can work in. Structural. Um, structural is to do with the mismatch, can be to do with the mismatch of the skills people have and the jobs that are available. Um, so for example, deindustrialization kind of summarizes uh, structural through various things. So obviously, um, other countries um, gaining a comparative advantage in certain industries. So industry decline within an economy is structural change um, as people lose, as jobs close, as businesses um, relocate, people are left with jobs or skills and the, the jobs that you know that they used to work on aren't there anymore. So that's quite long-term unemployment. Uh, technology advancements can also cause structural unemployment. So if you look at your um, your checkouts, your self checkouts, as they increase more in in um, regularity, obviously that leads to um, that form of unemployment as well. Um, <clears throat> automation, robotics, are real wage unemployment. Um, whenever the wage rate gets pushed up above the um, the or the the going rate. 
two causes of that. National minimum wage and trade unions, they create this movement here of contraction in the demand for labour, um, which is called real wage unemployment or classical unemployment. And you've also got C, cyclical unemployment, okay, which is also called demand deficient unemployment, which is to do with, um, basically, as the name says, a lack of demand within the economy to do with the business cycle, cyclical, so a downturn in the economy, less demand across the economy for goods and services. So we should see higher unemployment due to that. Um, consequences of unemployment then? Let's see if you can remember a few. So the consequences. <coughs> the key is really to go for your um, your different economic agents. So obviously for the individual unemployed business businesses I should say for the government and for the economy I'm not going to go through this too much because there's a video um, I've made this earlier um, so you can watch it obviously for the video or for the individual talk about personal things um, mental health things financial things uh, a good one for the individual to talk about is skill atrophy skilling whenever you're at work for so long you kind of lose your skills and certain uh, for, for the job you used to do perhaps businesses obviously things like less revenue uh, less confidence um, less output government um, obviously more spending on support less income from taxes etc as more people are at work the economy you could talk about hysteresis which is high levels of unemployment, leading to even higher levels of unemployment or damaging effects of high levels of unemployment. Um, and obviously your negative multiplier could go in there as well. So the video PPR, watch that for the consequences of unemployment. Cures for unemployment. The biggest thing governments have to remember whenever they're trying to cure unemployment. So the biggest thing you have to do is make sure they match the policy with the type. Okay, so for example, a bad scenario <coughs> would be if the economy was experiencing cyclical unemployment and the government were using, um, you know, um, lowering um, university uh, fees or they were spending more money on regional colleges. That would not work because obviously that's a structure that's um it's a long-term thing it's a supply side policy so it take a long time for them policies to feed through and improve unemployment so obviously you're looking at you know if it's tuition fees going down more people access and higher levels of education improvements in qualifications improvement in productivity seeing for regional colleges that is a supply side policy that's going to boost your lras outwards if you've got a cyclical unemployment, okay, you're here and you need to get up to there as soon as possible. And the only way you do that is by boosting AD, okay? And that's obviously done maybe by things like expansionary fiscal policy, expansionary monetary policy, boosting the economy, okay? So the most important thing you have to remember is the policy has to match the type whenever you're curing unemployment. Um, and it's a very good AO4 point, that, okay? If you've got an essay. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Inflation, I'll leave it with you for a minute there. Pause the video, see if you can remember as much as you can about inflation. So inflation is the sustained or persistent increase. Sustained or persistent increase in the general price level over a spot, a specific period of time. Okay, inflation. Um, types of inflation. There's three types. There's demand pull. There's cost push. And there's obviously monetary inflation. Okay, a little bit about each of them, really quickly. So, demand pull inflation is whenever there's excess demand within the economy. 
which means there's too much money chasing too few goods, which incentivizes firms to put up the prices. That's literally A S A D A D shift, sorry. That increase in the price level is demand pull inflation. Cost push is whenever firms throughout an economy experiencing higher costs, which squeezes their profit margins and therefore incentivizes them to pass the burden onto the consumer in the form of higher prices. So it's a response to the higher costs, obviously, kind of maybe what's happening in the minute with oil prices, etc. Uh, and then monetary inflation is uh, also something that's called the quantity theory of money. Sorry about my handwriting there, I got worse. And that's based on the Fisher equation, which is MV equals PT. Assumption is that the velocity of circulation, so how much a note circulates around the economy, and transactions, which is also to do with like GDP spending within the economy, are fairly constant over time. So if they're both constant, any increase in the money supply will lead to an increase in the price level. That's what monetarists believe, and they believe in the, uh, the, the economy can be controlled by the careful controlling of the money supply throughout the economy. And that's the thing that um, they believe will bring the most stability. Um, consequences for inflation. Use FN. Okay, so negative real interest rates. Remember how you calculate interest, real interest rates. So that is nominal interest rates minus inflation. So for example, if the nominal interest rate is, say, is 4% and inflation is 10%, the issue here is the real interest rate from minus 6%, which is an issue. Okay, It's an issue because obviously uh, if you save money, you obviously want to get inflation or uh, interest rate on it. You get 4%, you think that's pretty good. You put £100 away now, you bring it out in a year's time, you get 4% out of it, it's £104. But £100 worth of products in a year's time will actually be worth £110. So you're actually minus 6% in regards to how much that money can buy, which isn't a good thing. Uh, export prices are obviously going to be negatively affected by higher prices domestically. So it's going to reduce your international competitiveness. Um, a wage price spiral might arise in the sense that if there's higher inflation, remember it's a bit of a spiral, so higher inflation means workers ask for higher wages. To get their higher wages, firms with higher costs of production, they will put their prices up and this sort of spiral continues. Um, and that's not good, that, that's very bad if, if that starts to happen within the economy. Um, shoe leather costs kind of maybe happen in a minute. So higher prices are meaning consumers are trying to shop around, trying to find the lowest prices, the most competitive prices. It's sort of like a, the, the, the cost on inflation, the burden on inflation on consumers trying to be more, I suppose, um, prudent with money, you could say, uh, because obviously it's a cost of living issue, so they're trying to you know, make the most of the real income. Um, fallen real incomes as well. Obviously, remember, real incomes are incomes adjusted for inflation. If they're fallen, you can't buy as much. So therefore, um, you maybe that kind of links the shoe leather costs, I suppose. And then menu costs. Well, actually, maybe that's standard living is the biggest thing here. And then menu costs. I remember that's the financial cost of two businesses of having to update, basically, prices. So price lists, menus, websites, advertisements. Um, so that's obviously an issue if prices continue to change over and over again. Uh, deflation, I'll leave it with you for a minute. See what you can remember about deflation. So deflation is the sustained or persistent decrease in the general price level over a specific period of time. It's a fall. Remember, deflation is whenever the price level turns negative. Okay. Disinflation is whenever inflation goes for example from ten percent to nine percent to eight percent. Okay, that is prices are still rising, but they're rising at a falling rate. Okay, um, so ten percent.
percent rise, nine percent rise, eight percent rise. That's called disinflation. It's a it's a falling rate of inflation. Price are still rising, but they're rising at a falling rate. So <clears throat> remember the difference between infl deflation and disinflation. Uh, deflation is two big types. You've got your good and you've got your bad. Your good is called benign deflation, which is caused by improvements in productivity or the supply side of the economy. And that's kind of, if you think about your LRAS shifting outwards, that's the fall price level. That's what we're talking about here. The price is falling as the LRAS shifts out. So, and that's obviously caused by improvements in productivity or the supply side of the economy. And then you've got bad deflation, which is called malevolent, which is caused by a fall in demand in the economy, AD, which is not good. That's a confidence thing. That's animal spirits. That's a shock in the economy. That's like higher interest rates. That's like increasing taxes. That um, causes consumption to fall. Uh, AD shifts in malevolent deflation, lack of demand within the economy. Um, the issue, so this one's obviously good. So I suppose we could talk about positive consequences of, of good deflation. We've got enjoyflation, i.e. real incomes are higher for individuals. And you've obviously got, uh, also got export competitiveness increases because obviously our price level is lower, we can export more. Uh, issues with bad deflation, the biggest one, is consumption postponement people delay their spending okay they delay their spending if you know prices are falling you will wait and if you wait for prices to lower and if everyone does that it means businesses are going to be making less money it means they'll have to let go of workers to cover their costs that'll mean higher unemployment and that will cause a virtuous cycle of um of downward prices and reset basically recessionary other bads with um Oh, I've got to say one other good one. Sorry, one other good one is um, deflation is good for um, savers. Okay, so it's like good for savers, um, as opposed to um, the nominal interest or the the inflation that was bad for savers. Deflation is actually good for savers if you flip it around. So deflation actually pushes uh, real interest rates up, which obviously benefits savers, but if you think about it then it's bad for borrowers because the issue is deflation if you think about it increases how much you can buy with money it increases the value of money it increases the value of debt therefore you're in so it's not good for borrowers or um or people that are in debt um and then obviously you can talk about how deflation is bad um for for the government then as well i suppose with, with debt levels and higher interest rates um, but yeah, the big one, consumption postponement, and that has a knock-on effect upon unemployment, businesses, uh, etc. within the economy. Um, so that's deflation as well then. And then we've got balance payments. Pause, see how much you remember about the balance payments. So balance payments overall. That's got three sections. Sorry, what it is first, it's a financial record of all monetary transactions of a country with its trading, trading partners okay, other, or other countries. So it's a financial record of all monetary transactions of a country with others. Um, it's got three sections. It's got the current account, which is what I'm going to talk about now. It's got the capital account and it's also got the financial account. Uh, I'm going to focus on this one for now. Current account, it's got four sections. Trading goods, trading services, it's got primary income, and it's got secondary income. This used to be called investment income, and this used to be called transfers. Okay, <clears throat> um, trading goods, X minus M of visibles. That is, so that means anything that's traded and recorded as an export or an import of physical products would go into your trading goods. 
trading services, exports minus imports of invisibles. That's your services, that's your consultancy, that's your education, that's your financial, that's your insurance, that's tourism, uh, that goes under trading services. Uh, primary income is used to call it investment income, which is the return on investments, which is dip. So that's things like dividends, interests, and profits uh, would go under there. Also, incomes, remittances, or sent back home, would fall under primary income, but I always remember dip, dividends, interests, and profits. So it's the return on investments either from uh, someone in the UK that's invested in an American bank for, or an American bank, yeah, and got interest, that money come back in, would go down as a, an export, it would be positive entry. Whereas if um, someone invested in, um, in a, uh, got, got, uh, got dividends from a UK business and they were from Germany, that would go down as a negative entry. And then secondary income, used to call transfers and that's through government government aid government transactions they're all recorded under secondary income so that's the three sections remember everyone's either a positive entry or a negative entry positive are called credit entries and negative are called debit entries don't know what's going on when I write there but anyway so you've got negative credit positive debit entries. One other thing to remember, um, these first two sections are called the trading account. Um, and the UK run a deficit in the trading account, which means the value of imports of overall goods and services is greater than the value of all our exports. And the UK also operates a complete current account deficit as well which means the total value of all debit entries from all these four sections is greater than all the value of the credit entries, i.e. there's more money leaving the UK than coming in. Now, what you do need to understand is that has to be offset by a surplus, or will be offset by a surplus in these two, and the main way they're offset normally is through um, FDI, uh, which comes into the um, financial accounts um, but and portfolio investments as well but we'll not talk about that now we'll talk about that some other time um, so it's basically the, the balance of payments uh, the current account I should say um, the causes of a balance payments deficit hopefully you can remember the causes or tickles okay so trade policies Okay, so things like you would have a deficit if other countries uh, put up import tariffs because that would make your exports very uh, expensive because this extra tax is being placed on them. So for example, if America put more tariffs in UK exports, we wouldn't export as much to, um, to the USA. That could, be called, could cause a deficit. Um, likewise, if the UK reduced import tariffs, that will cause a massive increase in imports and possibly cause F4 deficits. So trade policies um, are something that will cause a um, a balance payments deficit. Uh, inflation. Obviously, if we've got high inflation, our exports are less competitive. If we've got deflation, our export will be more competitive. Uh, if we have inflation as well, actually, you're going to look to import possibly more goods and services from other countries because they'll be cheaper than domestically produced products. Uh, climate, if you can't produce something, you have to import it. Think about your seasonal, uh, or sorry, your, um, your, your, your products that can't be grown, your, veg your vegetables that can't be grown in the UK. Climate, uh, also certain technologies, certain raw materials, certain, um, certain um, minerals can't be produced, or don't, we don't have in the UK, so we have to import them. Loss of comparative advantage. Uh, if you are no longer the most efficient or have the lowest opportunity cost, which is what comparative advantage is, in producing, say, for example, cars, you won't be as competitive. Industries will probably decline within the economy. They'll go locate in the new country that has the comparative advantage or the improved competitiveness, and that will cause you to have to import that product then, which could cause a balance payments deficit. And then obviously strong currency. So you always remember spicy. So stronger pound makes imports cheaper, 
which means the value of our imports will go down. Or sorry, well, well, sorry, imports are cheaper, which means we'll probably import more, which means the imports will rise and exports are more expensive, so we'll stop exporting because they're not as competitive because of the external value of the pound. The pound can't buy it or um, isn't as competitive in other countries, so therefore we won't export as much and that will cause the balance payments to go into a deficit. Consequences of a, um, of a balance payments deficit is radius, hopefully you remember that as well. Um, reliant, reliance, AD, depreciation, industry decline, unemployment, and size, question mark. Um, let's go in opposite order this time. So size, question mark. Um, if it's a small deficit, actually the consequences might not be that big because if you've got a floating exchange rate, it might actually be able to self-correct. And what we mean by that is if you think about the situation originally is the import value is greater than exports. That's going to lead to um, a fall in the demand for your currency. So the pound will weaken and that leads to whippy deck is what you remember. Okay, so imports become dear and exports become cheaper. So actually the volume of imports we have falls and exports become more competitive. So we should export more. So actually what should happen is this will either balance or reverse. So actually the size of the balance payments deficit is uh, might not be that bad big because it might self-correct due to this occurring with the fixed exchange or the flowing exchange system. Unemployment, um, unemployment and AD kind of go hand in hand. Because obviously, if you think about it, if imports is greater than exports, that's going to cause AD to fall. If aggregate demand falls, obviously the assumption is that there's going to have a knock-on effect upon economic growth. Unemployment will rise. Um, industry decline can be linked to that as well. So there's normally, balance payments deficit is normally, but there's like an underlying factor behind it. It's like a lack of competitiveness. It's a, it's a supply side issue. And normally industries decline um, as a consequence of um, a balance payments deficit because they're not as competitive, they can't compete with these other countries and therefore we have to import. So industry decline is just shows a, a real um, lack of um, competitiveness within the economy. Uh, reliance as well, think about oil prices. If you have to import oil and the price goes up, it can cause massive shocks to the economy. It can cause massive... Um, can cause a recession ultimately if you're relying upon something and and something goes wrong you can't import it anymore it can a massive knock-on effect on businesses and then obviously a depreciation can occur if you've got a, a, a balance payments deficit if the currency depreciates like we said earlier it's whippy deck but if you focus in on that for a second itself these imports become more expensive and that can cause more inflation within the economy because you're paying more um, for, you're using more of your currency to buy the same amount of imports which makes them more expensive in the external markets which means the businesses have got higher costs which can lead to higher inflation as well so multiple things going wrong here that's not good for an economy if you've got a balance payments deficit and then finally how do you cure a balance payments deficit you've got an expenditure switching method or you've got an expenditure reducing method now I'll focus on expenditure just in first because that's basically in the UK what you have to remember is we've got a marginal propensity to import and what that means is as incomes rise we spend a higher proportion of that income on imported products so expenditure reducing policies basically mean to reduce incomes that would be increase taxes that would be increase interest rates okay um, things like that increase taxes maybe even pay freezes and, or government spending cuts or uh, all these things are going to reduce incomes within the economy. Uh, higher interest rates, more mortgage repayments, so less money to spend. Higher taxes, uh, lower disposable income, less government spending, AD falls and incomes will fall in the economy. All these things are designed to reduce expenditure. 
uh, and therefore we don't have as much money to spend on imports. Very extreme, obviously politically hard to do, um, and you can critique that in your AO4 quite easily. Uh, expenditure switching policies include things like protectionist policies. So that's obviously going to be things like putting your import tariffs up, import taxes up, import tariffs up, uh, which will stop imports. You could also encourage or promote domestic consumption, domestic uh, domestically produced products, I should say, however. Um, uh, so we've got protections and we've got encouraged domestic production. You've also got um, reduction in the, the currency. So if you uh, depreciate the currency, that should make exports more expen or uh, more competitive. Um, it should help boost exports and reduce imports and reduce the um, deficit. They are expenditure switching policies. Now what I want to say is your um, your tickles for balance payments deficit. Obviously, just final thing is because it has come up in questions before. I know the UK operates a deficit, but if there's surpluses in any of these things, you have to spend a bit of time to get yourself reversing these things. So being able to go from so if it's if it's causes of a surplus, basically tickles is reversed. Okay, so you can just you know what trade policies are going to cause us to export more than we import. What's inflation going to be? It could be deflation, which will cause exports to rise. Climate, a bit of a, not, we're not going to really go any, I don't know how climate would um, impact, but you can maybe talk about if we have a resource, if we have a, an absolute advantage in a resource that all countries need. So, for example, maybe um, uh, maybe maybe China has a, has a surplus because they've got an abundance of minerals and, and iron ore and um, raw materials that all the countries need. So you could make that work uh, again in competitiveness would cause a surplus and the currency wouldn't be strong it would be whippy dick so make sure you can understand and explain the reversal of surpluses the causes of surpluses and then obviously for the consequences of surpluses radius needs to be reversed as well okay so you need to be reversed radius obviously size still works um but you need to be able to talk about AD, for example, increasing if there's a surplus. And that obviously isn't good because it can cause inflation, inflationary pressures within the economy. Uh, it will cause the cost of currency to depreciate. It will to cause it to appreciate. And you need to think about dollar repercussions of that. Um, so I think the, the biggest thing with the surplus is the fact that exports rise and it's very inflationary. But see if you can work through them all at once there. And be able to explain um, or how you could maybe turn them into to negatives of a surplus and that i believe let me just double check is the meeples i wanted to get done there so um if you want to watch that video again a few times please do so um and obviously try and do like maybe a, a mind map um before each one and see if everything we've said uh, has been covered and obviously see if you can um see if you can um yeah get as much as i can or add more in if there's been anything missed okay so thanks for your time watch that again please um i'm happy revision